Hello, everyone. Welcome and welcome back to the Virtual Research Forum. We are now here at the Ask the Experts uh, session, and uh, I am humbled to be joined today by Dr. Angela Genge, the Director of the Clinical Research Unit at the Montreal Neurological Institute and of the ALS Clinic at the Montreal Neurological Institute at McGill University, and also Professor at University de Montréal, Dr. Christine Van de Veld. Hello, both of you. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hi. So we have uh, a boatload of questions that have been submitted ahead of time, and we have uh, uh, already some live ones. So um, well, let's maybe uh, start with one by Anthony. And Anthony had actually asked that based on the last several years of research, are we any closer to discovering why certain people suffer from ALS versus others? Some of you may have heard about that earlier at the start of the day. Uh, we had a lot about the precision medicine, but uh, maybe I'll throw over to Dr. Vandeveld and you could you could talk a little bit about what we're we're learning in terms of that. Sure. Um, so thank you very much for the question, Anthony. Uh, it's a great question. Um, we heard earlier today there's a, a, a large heterogeneity in the patient population. So we know that there are some patients that have a family history, but even with the family history, they could have a large number of different genetic uh, reasons for why the disease is in those patients. And we also have um, the large pool of patients, which we refer to as sporadic ALS, are very heterogeneous. They have different um, and different uh, sites of onset, different lengths of disease. Um, and why that is has actually been a longstanding question in the field. There are these large uh, efforts underway right now, which we heard about today, Project Mine, others are, um, that are interested in that. Um, and I think um, understanding what, um, what underlies the heterogeneity of patients is actually a, a really a prime a primary question in the field right now and something that we really need to focus on. A lot of groups are turning in that direction and really trying to understand, can we group patients according to certain types of phenotypes by doing deep clinical phenotyping? Can we probe the genetics deeper, even in the sporadic patients? Can we find biomarkers that be able to subgroup patients? This is something that I think is um, a primary question that everybody is looking at. And I think ALS Canada is putting together a plan to move in that direction. Uh, Dave, maybe did you want to say something about that? Well, actually, uh, yeah. I mean, I think I think there's a big interest uh, in in that was spoken about earlier by Dr. Rothstein and and a number of others in terms of the the whole world starting to think this way and and beginning to start to focus on that major hurdle, which is understanding human ALS. Uh, um, as we have really made great strides in our understanding in the laboratory level of animal models, in which some of those were presented. But, you know, we still have so, so far to go in terms of understanding humans in ALS, but we're, you know, we're finally at a point where we can start to tackle sporadic ALS where we haven't before. And actually, uh, you know, this actually leads into a, another question that was, uh, was uh, given earlier um, by uh, Dave in South Africa and also Anthony. Um, so this might actually be a good time for Dr. Genge to, uh, to um, uh, provide some extra expertise as well, because you know, there were other questions about uh, people who had very unique symptoms and were diagnosed with ALS, but they were very different from the standard symptoms of ALS. And so, you know, taking that into account, you, you see a lot of people with ALS on a regular basis. So um, maybe you could comment on, on that heterogeneous aspect of the disease. Well, we, uh, thanks. And thanks for the question. Well, the, the heterogeneity comes from the different that for ALS comes from the different ways in which uh, when you have damage to the motor nervous system, the symptoms can present. So although we call everything that fits under um, under the motor nervous system in the body um, potential symptoms and signs of ALS, there are certain ones that we see commonly and others that we see much more rarely. And yet they're all ways in which damage to the motor nervous system can show up in a patient. So the typical uh, findings uh, when you're developing ALS are a slurred speech because the motor nerves that control your the muscles that allow you to speak get affected. 
difficulty swallowing for the same reason. Rarely it can be, it can start with difficulty breathing. Again, not because of a muscle problem, but because the nerves, the motor nerves that control your muscles of breathing start becoming affected. But in your arms and legs, those symptoms can be even more variable. We talk a lot about fasciculations as a very common feature, but not everybody with ALS notices their fasciculations. We have uh, cramping, which is another common feature, but there are patients who do not have cramps. But certainly stiffness, weakness, thinning of muscles are all a result of damage to motor nerves and certainly can present, um, be part of what it looks like to have ALS. The uncommon things, the things that we don't see very often and, and lead us to make sure that something else is not going on are things like if you feel tingling, if you feel uh, buzzing, itchiness. These are not common features of ALS uh, or of your motor nervous system. So if we hear those kind of symptoms, we have to look a little bit harder. We also uh, know that um, a nasal speech is less common in ALS than a speech that sounds like you've been drinking too much. We don't expect clumsiness per se to be uh, a sign of ALS. So when that shows up, we look for, for uh, another possibility. The so symptoms... The concern that patients often have um, is that these unusual symptoms mean they have another disease other than ALS. And in fact, although we're really, really close to having a marker in our a cerebrospinal fluid that can help us say this is, fits the symptoms and the change in, your, in their cerebrospinal fluid both fit with ALS, and your EMG tests both, all fit with ALS, so you're very confident of the diagnosis. If you have some of these unusual symptoms, then we take even more care at looking for what we call a mimic to the ALS. Does that help you, Dave? Well, <laughs> sure. And, and so actually, it's an interesting to follow that up briefly. Um, so if someone were to have uh, some of those more unique features like sensory loss, for example, um, in your experience, have you seen individuals who, you know, unquestionably in your mind, you would characterize them as having a variant of ALS, but they also have uh, other symptoms that are, are less characteristic? Absolutely. We all have patients who have um, at least one or two symptoms that are unusual for ALS, but um, but that it doesn't rule out that they that doesn't mean they do not have ALS. It means that they have an atypical variant, um, and certainly when we see those kind of patients, we look extra hard for rare things that can mimic ALS. Okay. Thank you. So actually, for both of you, when you know, to follow up on that, um, and, and still a question from Anthony, um, he also wondered about early detection and uh, of both hereditary and non-hereditary ALS. So um, this was something alluded to earlier a, a little bit with uh, uh, Martin Turner's presentation. Um, but uh, along those same lines, that uh, you know, uh, what are the types of things that we can do or what we might be able to do moving forward? Um, to uh, detect the disease earlier and reduce that time for diagnosis. Perhaps uh, Dr. Genge again for this one might be a good start, but we can follow up with Dr. Vandeveld. Could I hear your question again, Dave? Sure. So in terms of, uh, you know, where are we at in terms of trying to increase the early detection of both hereditary and non-hereditary ALS? So um, I'm glad you had Dr. Turner on today. He's, he's actually... A, made some real breakthroughs in some findings that both suggest that there's a, an inflammatory component and finding markers for us uh, to make those very clear uh, diagnosis. There is, there is actually even another person um, who's led research for a few years now, Bob Bowser, who has come up with another marker that if we have it in this in the uh, 
cerebrospinal fluid, the fluid that uh, exists around the brain, then that that is considered confirmatory for ALS and actually um, really helps separating out patients with ALS from patients who look like they have ALS but don't, uh, what I've been calling ALS mimics. So these days, right now, our strongest candidates for a diagnostic test, a test that if you look like you have ALS and you, all of your physical examination and your EMG looks like you have ALS, there are now at least two different types of candidates. They're both currently found most successfully in a lumbar puncture uh, in the fluid, and both of these can really help us say yes or no, even early in the disease. So we are much farther along than we were, Dave, even a couple of years ago. Yeah, and actually, I, if for, for those who might have heard Dr. Turner's talk, there was actually a really cool idea I'd never thought about before, which is um, he had been talking about neurofilament uh, elevation in terms of uh, being a broad sort of marker for neurological damage or neurodegeneration. And, you know, if you could standardize a way in which GPs could be able to do a very easy test to say, okay, is this something that you need to see a neurologist about at an early symptom time point, then perhaps those people could get into an ALS clinic earlier than they normally would. And, and that's a way of it not being the ALS clinic that actually shortens the, the diagnosis time, but in conjunction with being referred to earlier so they can do the right tests, uh, they might be able to diagnose earlier. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, um, I agree. So, so actually, I'm going to switch because uh, uh, Dr. Vandeveld might be great for the question from Dr. Kumar, um, thinking from an experimental uh, motor neuron uh, idea. So Dr. Kumar was asking in, uh, about a motor neuron model that might be more of a mathematical way to represent uh, what's happening in the disease. Um, and, you know, if this isn't being done, you know, why is it not being done? Why is this something that we're not trying to understand how we can, uh, in a sense, model the disease through data and through um, uh, sort of a mathematical model? So it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, the short answer, I think, is that it is something that people think a lot about, but there is a major limitation is that this is very expensive work to do. Um, there is, uh, some big efforts out there to try to incorporate big data and artificial intelligence in order to mine this data um, to try to better um, mathematically, as, the, as Dr. Kumar referred to, uh, model the disease. One actually recent example of where um, AI has been implemented is the mm -hmm. IP Watson uh, project. So this was led by Bob Bowser out of Arizona, in which they partnered with IBM and they fed uh, I think it was five years of data of papers, and so maybe 15,000 uh, papers were imputed into IBM Watson. And then they asked IBM Watson, is that based on the data that was imputed, whether or not they could, it would make a prediction about other genes that might be linked to ALS, on the premise that there seems to be some trends that are coming out that the genes that are known to be linked to ALS sort of classify into maybe three or four uh, groups. And that work actually, which was published last year, really did actually reveal um, a potential candidate list for other genes for ALS, one of which I believe has, has now been um, tested and validated, and it'd be I think TIA1. Um, so that would be an example of where AI is being implemented. Um, how to use AI to map the mechanisms of the disease, I think that that is um, sort of the next step. Uh, the initial work by the Bowser group is really proof of principle that IBM Watson could have value. And I think that there are groups that are moving forward with that besides that one. Uh, and I, I suspect that we'll see more of that over the next five years or so, but it is a very expensive endeavor. And um, the AI and these mathematical modeling, you have to train the models in order to be able to get predictive value out of them. Um, and so that takes time. Yeah, I think it's a really good point about the fact that yeah, I, I think the, the the thought and the desire to do it is there. It's that unfortunately, you know, ALS is is still underfunded compared to a lot of the places where you're gonna you're gonna hear about those types of models made, and also the complexity of the central nervous system compared to 
um, you know, other types of cells where maybe they're able to do this type of thing. And actually, uh, Dr. Genge, I might, I might even point out that the, the thought process around mathematical uh, modeling of, of stuff probably with origins would be another example of where, you know, the, the field has put some effort into trying to understand, you know, how you can even come up with an equation that can measure the prognosis of someone living with ALS. Um, so, um, great lead-in question, Dave. Um, so, for those online, um, this is actually a brilliant step forward that doesn't, it wasn't done in a lab. It was really done mathematically, as Dave says. But what, uh, what they did, and I think the story is worth it, what they did is made a contest to get people to look at uh, mathematical equations, AI or whatever lingo you want to use, and use and come up with an equation that could predict the speed of progression in a patient. And there's there are a couple good reasons we should know that. And it is it is very difficult to predict the speed of, of progression in an individual patient, but these models help us uh, predict uh, speeds of progression in, in small groups of patients. And then two groups won the contest, and both of the groups used a, a data a set of patient information that was de-identified, and, and everyone's privacy was protected. And these two groups that won the contest beat the experts, they beat um, the clinics, they beat the literature, they beat everybody in developing a model that allows us to predict well how do how patients should progress and that becomes important because when we're testing new drugs we need to make sure that the patients that are getting the drug in both the where they're getting the drug and where they're getting the placebo are the same pay, uh, populations of patients because if you have really slow progressors in the placebo arm you can miss an effect of a good drug because you didn't have the right patients in each group. On the contrary, if you have really fast progressors in the placebo arm, you can also give an artificially positive result from a clinical trial. So you may be moving a drug forward in ALS that's not as good as the statistics seem to show. So these, uh, these what we call algorithms are now being used to make sure that all the groups in clinical trials are well balanced so that if there is an effect seen in the patients receiving the drug, then that effect can be attributed to the drug they're taking and not some other random accident. How's that, Dave? <laughs> That's great. Um, I, and I hope uh, uh, for Dr. Kumar that that is a good answer for you know, the mindset that we're, we're, we're there in terms of what we want to do and the, the people who we want to bring in and have, you know, I think one of the other pieces, what comes to mind for me is, is it's getting people interested in ALS who have these outside um, uh, foci or the interests. So, you know, it's very simple to say to somebody who has computer technology and AI capabilities, well, we want you to fix cancer or different types of cancer because it's, it's got a broad awareness but saying you know we, we want you to spend all of your time focusing on ALS becomes more difficult to, uh, of a prospect because you know it doesn't have the same footprint as some of those so um, it, it, in, in what both you said is that we we're very much focused on that it's now about bringing in the right players and finding the ability to support them to uh, to do the work and be focused on ALS but I would if I were to switch now, like one of the questions, we get a lot of questions from individuals about um, clinical aspects of the mm -hmm. disease, but also risk factors. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we could start with a little bit of the clinical side and then move to the risk factors. And I think that that would involve uh, both of you. Um, but in terms of uh, um, maybe Dr. Genj, again, in terms of research that's helping people mm -hmm. who are affected mm -hmm. and living with ALS or a neuromuscular condition today, um, maybe you could speak to, you know, some of the things that are in the mindset of researchers around um, what you could do for someone who's living with ALS today or how research might help them. So, uh, 
for Dave, I think what you want to know is is the benefits to a patient to be involved in a clinical trial. Is that what you're you're really well, asking? I, I believe the question is really saying that you know there's a lot of talk about future having treatments in the future, but you know if you if you're someone living with ALS today. Um, how does research A affect you and how can you help be a part of research? So I think that can come from anywhere from a quality of life, clinical management of the disease. So research done to improve that, but also exactly like you said, uh, um, clinical trials for treatments to be involved in and, and uh, even assistive technology. So I, I guess, I mean, I sort of answered some of those, but I, um, maybe your perspective would be better than mine. <laughs> So there's a couple of uh, really important lessons we've learned. One is um, whether the clinical trials are for medication or from for some other intervention, and that intervention can be nutrition, it can be to help breathing, new technology for breathing, it can be um, symptomatic management, just treating cramps or pain or or uh, or difficulty swallowing. All of these things, we see benefits for, for everyone who goes into these different kinds of clinical research projects. What the, when this is looked at really carefully, whether you get um, an active drug or a placebo or whether you get one kind of, um, of device or another, the benefit of just being involved in a clinical research project or a clinical trial improves your quality of life and improves how long you live. And that may seem odd to people, but in fact, it has seems to have to do with the fact that not only are the big issues being addressed, how well you breathe or how well you eat or whether or not you're lo losing weight, but when you're part of a clinical trial, you, you have an opportunity to ask even your smallest questions, the little things that may be giving you a, a problem, um, and you have a lot of ex additional contact with, uh, with healthcare personnel that allow just these little problems to be dealt with in a way that uh, makes a difference to how long you live and how well you live. So even... So I think that that's actually a really important a thing that people have discovered when looking at um, patients who participate in clinical research projects. They've noticed the same things when um, they compare someone who's followed by a neurologist in the community to someone who's followed by um, a multidisciplinary clinic. And, and that's what we call any place that can provide not only medical care, but nursing care, respiratory care, nutritional care, all the other things we add in to our Canadian ALS clinics. And we see, if you look back, these patients who go to these clinics, even if they don't go a lot, but the fact that they go somewhere where all of their issues are answered means that they live longer and, and uh, at a much higher level. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I. I guess actually, maybe this might be. An opportunity. I was going to turn it to you, uh, Dr. Vandebel, but if you'd like to speak to it, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that everything that Angela said, absolutely, I think is 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 true. And I think the other thing to consider is that um, that the patients can participate in research without necessarily having to be in a trial, because of course there are uh, you know there's a subset of patients that don't qualify. Or they don't meet the inclusion criteria, for example, for a given clinical trial. So they can still contribute by allowing perhaps their genetic uh, information to be collected or deep phenotyping of their clinical symptoms, or they may uh, elect to later on. So they can all make a contribution um, to the research program collectively. So we're only going to be able to address that heterogeneity in the disease, for example, by being able to have large numbers of patients that are uh, agreed to be uh, deep phenotyped clinically and then having matching uh, imaging data and genetic data and perhaps even um, samples of blood that can be then taken where those cells can be converted into motor neurons in which we can then probe mechanism. And why is it that one patient has, mm -hmm. a, has a particular fast disease versus another patient which has a shorter 
uh, duration of the disease. So those will be answered by being able to actually use patient cells that we can reprogram into the motor neurons that are lost mm -hmm. in the disease. Thanks. So actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this opportunity as well because, and this is a question from Roger. Thank you, Roger. Um, you know, I'm, and, and I'm, as, as we're answering this, I, I'm thinking about this also from another perspective in that, you know, when, when someone living with ALS is wondering how are things, you know, we're talking about the future, how are things going to help them? Um, I thought maybe this would be good for both of you. And, and Dr. Vandeveld, I know you've been working on ALS from a, a molecular standpoint and trying to understand the disease from a molecular standpoint for two decades almost. Um, you know, so you'd be able to understand or be able to speak to the, the nature at which the researchers really do care about trying to get to something for some poor people as fast as possible. And the, and the same hand from the clinical side, Dr. Gensch, I mean, the, the, the passion that everyone feels for wishing we could get there faster, but still knowing that it's never going to be fast enough. And I thought maybe you could, uh, you could quickly speak to the fact that, you know, people are really trying as hard as they can. Um, and we've come I, I, yes, they are. It's actually, we have come an amazing amount of a way. I mean, it's been, yeah, it's kind of making me feel old, almost two decades, but um, it has, uh, there, the, the trainees and the research teams that are um, searching for what are the causes that underlie the disease and how can we understand that so we can design better mm -hmm. treatments. It is a really, uh, they're a very, very large, extensive collaborative groups. They're very earnest in their way to deeply care. They're very motivated when they encounter patients either at the ALS walks or in other events. They are diligently attending all ALS talks and mm -hmm. the research forum, uh, the Andre de Lam Symposium in Quebec City. Uh, the students are very, very motivated. And, uh, I, I think... Hello? It's something that is it's not unique to my team. It is something that we're really trying to get now in the future. And Dr. Gens, yeah. from the clinical? I think that the, uh, the difference over the decades has been unbelievable. We've gone from, um, we've gone from doing uh, clinical trials and drug development on, on drugs simply because we needed to be attempting to find treatments to where we are in 2018 in October, where we have now drugs designed specifically for certain genetic mutations. We are starting to uh, test drugs that, uh, that affect very specific pathways. Um, and we're gone, we've gone from one new drug to try every two years to six, eight, ten, twelve new trials by next spring. There should never be a patient again that is told there's nothing to be done. Patients should be finding or being referred to clinics that can offer them what is really new and giving them the opportunity to make a difference in their own lives by uh, participating, by treating their symptoms, by all the different things that we now have available. Okay, so I'm actually gonna group a couple of the questions we've had from some of the individuals. We, we frequently get questions about risk factors. And so if we put together some of the questions that we've had about pesticides, um, uh, exercise, for example, um, stress, uh, even the fact that some ALS may be clustered together into certain regions. I know that's a lot of questions at once, but, um, you know, I, I was wondering if maybe we could start with Dr. Vandeveld, but like what, over that time that you've been studying ALS, like what have we been able to gather in terms of that type of information? And, uh, you know, I, obviously we, it's, it, those are hard things to, to measure and to have any kind of definitive answer. Yeah, so it's a great it's a great set of questions and I totally understand where they're coming from because it's hard to imagine that we wouldn't have a better handle on what are the risk factors but um, the, the the answer is is that we're, we're really still learning um, whether or not pesticides for example or other chemicals or cigarette smoke are linked to a higher instance of ALS 
is something that there is not broad consensus in the field um, in one direction or another. This is in part because um, the epidemiology, so the understanding the, the risks or the ex environmental exposures that individuals might have over the course of their life and how they, it tracks with uh, whether or not they develop ALS, there's not a lot of epidemiology that is done in the ALS space. Um, and this is something that has been identified as an under, underfunded area. Um, and I know that ALS Canada has uh, has looked to try to fill that gap as of other agencies. Mm -hmm. And some of these larger efforts now that are out there, like Answer ALS um, mm -hmm. and Project Mind, they have components mm -hmm. of that that are kind of built into that. So I think there's more information that will come in the next few years, but there doesn't exist a really a great consensus of whether or not, uh, for example, pesticides specifically are linked to the ALS. We do know that um, motor neurons are reported to be more vulnerable to different types of uh, stress so here I'm not you're not emotional stress so not per se but the idea of an environmental encounter with something in the environment um, we, we say that in the lab as true and in, in the animal models just looking at normal motor neuron physiology that seems to be true but yet despite knowing that we've never yet really pinpointed a particular agent that we know for sure will increase somebody's chances of developing the disease the same goes for exercise and effect Interestingly enough, in mouse models of ALS, exercise actually are benefic is beneficial um, and slows down the disease progression. And there's been some work on the mechanism of that, but how to translate those mouse studies into how much exercise a patient should should do or not do is it's difficult. And, and it's not a, it's not a linear relationship, I don't think. Right, and actually, uh, Andreas had a question about head trauma or about trauma, and uh, and that that follows around the exact same line of things. Is that there's some anecdotal beliefs here and there, but there's just not enough done um, and enough big studies that have managed to uh, to accrue to any any kind of result that we could we could speak to. Um, and, and actually, Dr. Genge, having you know, being someone that's that's seeing people with ALS on a regular basis, um, you know, what would your uh, typically be telling them in terms of th these types of aspects, trauma, um, different environmental factors, uh, exercise? Well, Dave, it's a good question. Um, and it's a question that's asked by at least 80% of patients because they want, people want to understand they were well, they still feel well, and suddenly they have just been told that they have this, uh, this very progressive neurologic disease, and yet they don't feel like they did anything to cause it. They often don't feel sick. So uh, what I usually tell people is it's really important for me to document what you think you've been exposed to, that we have a little bit of information, but we're nowhere near being able to say that because you worked in a, in a pesticide-heavy region that pesticides caused your disease, or because you were a football player, the football, the concussions caused your disease. There is... There are trends, but there's no absolute uh, result that's still av that's yet available. So I just document what people think they've been exposed to, so that at some point in the future, we will be able to really pull everyone's information together to be able to give much firmer answers than we can now. And yeah, and I guess that would go for the same thing as clusters, because quite frequently people ask me about a certain region of Canada where there's an increased incidence that they'll see, or there would be an increase in one town or city. Um, uh, Alan had a great question about that, um, and and it would be the same sort of thing because we you know we see so many ebbs and flows in certain areas of 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 high incidence of ALS, but then it's low for a while, and, and then another place this will crop up, and it becomes very difficult to actually have any level of, of statistical significance connecting uh, any of these particular regions, same, same as environmental factors. Would you agree, or? Would, we, I, I, would I agree on what part? Well, well in terms of do you see so in in your practice in, in Quebec for example would you see that there would be regions sometimes that would have higher higher numbers of people living with ALS and then it would be somewhere else that tends to have like uh, multiple people in a small area um, 
And, and, and then, of course, they're going to be interested in why is it that there's five people in my city that's quite small uh, that has ALS. And uh, in the same way as risk factors, it's kind of hard to make those kind of assessments when you're not talking about thousands and thousands of people. Yeah, and so we have clusters. We call them clusters, Dave, and, and we have clusters like that quite regularly. Um, I think clusters ultimately are going to give us some really important information. So I never discount clusters. I just make sure I document them well. And if possible, identify uh, in the cluster what they could potentially all have been exposed to. Um, not because I can use it immediately, but down the road I may be able to come back to uh, a group and say, yeah, we've, uh, you know, we've discovered that ALS is a result of exposure to this particular um, toxin, and it was in your your brother, your parent was part of the cluster because it was in the water or the soil or something like that. We just don't have, in none of the clusters that I've identified over the years, and as I said, I have have a number uh, throughout Quebec. They've come to me from several different regions. I haven't yet been able to sort of nail the reason for the cluster, but I document all of them. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to, I, I'm conscious there's going to be, a, there are a number of questions we have about Radicava. So I, I would like to get to some of those. I'm just going to follow one more question that we had from Bill and also uh, from another uh, person online just in the live questions, which is around the potential of ALS being contagious. And I think both of you can speak to this um, in, in different ways from people that think of the molecular aspects that um, some say, some some say yes, some say don't. And, and then others who have who've talked about, for example, organ donation uh, with ALS. Um, so perhaps we can start with Dr. Vandeveld in terms of the idea um, that exist that, you know, whether or not there would be a, a transmissible factor in ALS? So the, the short answer is that as of, as of now, to date, there is no evidence that um, ALS can be transmitted from one individual to the next, to, to another, just by contact or anything like that. In the animal models, there is interesting data that speaks to how the disease might spread within the nervous system of, a, of one animal. Um, but not we, we frequently house um, mice that uh, will develop ALS in cages yeah. with their litter mates, so their brothers and sister mice that do not have the gene that would encode for them to develop ALS. And we have never seen a, a, a non-ALS mouse develop ALS. So that would be evidence, uh, further evidence that there's no there's no uh, contagion here that has passed from one individual uh, to another. Yeah, and actually, even in the mice, we've we've heard of studies that have happened where they've tried to sort of mimic one mouse to the other, and uh, and 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 had not been able to come to any uh, any no. proof that that actually could happen. Um, yeah. So, um, on on that note, it was Dr. only inject directly into the central nervous system. Right. So, and, and Dr. Genge, in terms of that same sort of question. And, you know, what's the sentiment of people who talk about organ donation for individuals living with ALS? Uh, so, so the issue around organ donation is, is it's a double-edged sword. There's no, there is no research reason why you could not donate your organs with ALS. There's no evidence in all the research that everyone is doing that there's something transmissible and therefore you should be able to donate. However, when you actually look at all the information around organ donation, one of the criteria for not being allowed to donate is if the cause of the underlying disease is not identified. And that is the line that tends to prevent patients with ALS from donating most of their organs. I believe they can donate their lenses, but it is a line not that it is transmissible, but rather that we do not, we cannot give them the cause of ALS. So it does limit what you can, um, 
the ability to uh, um, to donate your organs for living transplants. Um, we have, um, but we have a lot of work going on uh, to uh, use anyone who's prepared to donate their their brain and spinal cord to science. Uh, in which we're working very hard to use these uh, these donations with the utmost respect and to try to speed up our, our understanding of the disease. So organ donations to a human um, recipient, a transplant, very limited if you have ALS because we don't yet know the absolute cause. Donations uh, to uh, for science to science by ALS patients very gratefully received because the more we are able to test our our science on these tissues, the faster we can learn what is really going on in the disease. And I'm sure Dr. Vandeville would agree with would agree with me on that. I Okay, <laughs> she. I think she agrees. Um, I'd like to. Oh, did you want to speak, or did you? Okay. So actually, I think maybe we could quickly spend ten minutes on Radicava, um, because I think that that's having been recently approved by Health Canada. I think there are a number of questions that have come from that, and then maybe we can spend the last ten minutes just wrapping up from a clinical standpoint in terms of clinical trials for five minutes, and then also from the molecular and 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 and. Uh, the understanding uh, point of, you know, really where are we at and what what can we say to people in terms of what we can expect in the next several years with regard to both of those. In terms of Radicava, uh, Dave, Marnie, and Lloyd all had questions. If I group them together, I think I could probably take one of them, which is what's next now that it's approved and how do we um, talk about coverage? Um, will the provincial health care system subsidize this? Um, quite uh, straightforward on this in terms of we don't know yet what's going to happen with that what happens after health canada approval is it um and during health canada's uh, assessment of radicava um there's a process that's ongoing uh with a a body called cadet and also in quebec called ines and they ultimately are assessing whether or not um, they can provide a recommendation to the provinces as to whether or not they believe this should be covered and whether it should be covered um, uh, under uh, the uh, public system of healthcare um, uh, widely or for a subset of individuals. And, and, and once they've made that recommendation, um, there are a number of other steps that occur. So there's a, 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 a what's called the PMPRB, which will help to set what the price in Canada will be. There's also a Pan-Canadian um, Alliance, which involves um, the, the provinces being able to work together to decide on a potential recommendation. And then it will go to each of the provinces individually to decide whether or not they will cover this on uh, their provincial formularies, meaning that you'd be able to get it prescribed and actually be able to get it without having to pay outright for the cost of the drug. Um, in terms of people with private insurance, if it is uh, able to be covered, as soon as the drug is manufactured in large enough uh, quantities by the company, um, then, then it becomes available for prescription. Uh, th that could be covered now that it's, it's, it's approved by Health Canada. Um, and so uh, those things are working, uh, we're hoping as quickly as possible because we obviously uh, don't want uh, the gaps to be there. But if, if anyone else would like to speak uh, to that of, of Dr. Genj or Dr. Vandevelt, uh, um, you know, those are just sort of a quick overview um, in light of some of the other questions. Or no? Oh, the, okay. The, um, but in terms of, uh, sorry. Okay, Dr. Genj. So, so, but maybe some of the, the other questions they had. Um, and w one of the questions was, who qualify? Oh, so actually, maybe I should skip to um, <clears throat> uh, how might this be prescribed for patients? Um, and uh, an individual in particular had asked about. Um, you know how you'll be able to assess who you would want to prescribe it for um, and how you'll make that assessment and then you know for an individual who's a slow progressor what do we know about that um, and uh, essentially how do we then access it because someone also asked about ordering the drug um, so perhaps you can speak to what the process will be moving forward okay so where we are now is we have 
a positive clinical trial that gives a group of patients that was defined before the drug was given to them as patients who responded to the drug. When Health Canada reviewed it, they approved it for patients with ALS. They did not set limits on who could access the Darabal. However, in Canada, that's only the first step. So the second step, which will happen with CADIS and INES, the provincial bodies, uh, the provincial bodies that determine what each province will cover. And, and that becomes really important for patients in Canada because the list price, if you go and buy it off the shelf, is, uh, is the price, uh, it could be set the same as it is in the U.S. We don't have a list price yet. In Canada, if you have a disease and there's a drug available, a doctor is supposed to be allowed to write a prescription and the patient is supposed to be able to get the drug. With, Radica with Radicava or Adaravone, we're waiting to find out what each province, what the rules around who can get the drug from each province uh, will be. So the next step is in process now. We should find out about the by it in November. I don't think it'll be before. And what we will find out is will the provinces cover all patients getting the drug, provide um, a Daravon to all patients with ALS, or will they narrow the patients who are eligible to get um, a Daravon based upon the clinical trial that was done. So we could see everything from you can get prescribed a Daravone once you have the diagnosis of ALS, if you fit, if you are early in your disease, if your breathing is good, various variables, or we could see access to a, a Daravone. So a doctor is able to prescribe a Daravone to patients with ALS until patients are on a ventilator, say. That's the full range. Which patients will, which rules will apply will depend on the reports from CADIS, one organization, and INES, which is a Quebec organization. So once we have, once we have that information, that'll be the next step. There's actually another step after that, and that step with a Daravone is how we will be able to give a patient a drug. Will the public systems, like your nurses in the community, be allowed to go to your home and give you your Daravone? Will you have to go to a hospital to get your Daravone? Will you be covered in a private infusion clinic to get your Daravone? All of these things will come after we know what INES and CADIS will say. Then the, while that third step is going on, the, the decision about the cost of the drug will be made. And again, you may have some discussion because the cost of the drug has a lot of pieces to it and um, the development of the drug by the company versus what the Canadian government um, wants to pay for the drug may be far enough apart that it takes some time to resolve. The other issues that uh, Dave raised, will slow progressors uh, gain, uh, get benefit from this, uh, from a Daravone? Right now, we don't know. But if somebody presents with ALS, we're not going to wait until we see how they're progressing before we uh, prescribe a Daravone. We're going to prescribe a Daravone when they make the diagnosis if they want to try the drug. Once someone starts a Daravone, we will be watching them to see if what happens, whether they get side effects, whether their disease slows down in terms of what we expect to see, um, and whether uh, what happens to their functional rating scale. All patients with ALS quickly learn about their ALS-FRS, and that will be used as a guide for the physicians. 
and obviously also their breathing status. We expect that we will have to report to the provincial governments um, people's um, functional rating scale and potentially their breathing status in order to get the drug renewed, even for whoever receives the drug. As soon as Health Canada approved Radicava, patients in Canada can no longer go outside Canada and do the personal importation, to my knowledge. So right now, we're really waiting for the provinces to finish their process and this new arm of Health Canada that does the pricing to finish their process and the negotiation with the company to be finished. But any patient who's newly diagnosed with ALS in Canada will have a discussion with their neurologist at the, their multidisciplinary clinic to determine whether they want to try Radicava or not. There will be patients who don't feel they get any benefit and they won't stay on it. There will be patients that feel they get a lot of benefit and they will stay on the Radicava. There will be a range. Hope that helps. Yeah. Well, I think we have a next. Let's do it over here. Um, do you wanna, oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you for that. I just have to say that if I was talking over either of you at some point, um, I apologize because the sound wasn't coming out of my computer, so I couldn't hear if someone was speaking. So we're doing it from two computers right now. Um, <clears throat> in the last 10 minutes, um, I thought it might be good to, to focus on a few of the questions that um, people had around, you know, where are we going next? So Dr. Vandeveld, if I were to ask sort of, what your thoughts are on, on beyond maybe even, uh, we've talked a lot about the precision medicine type ideas and, and, and tackling human ALS, but from a standpoint of maybe therapeutic targets and understanding uh, what's happening with ALS, could you maybe um, give an idea of where you see the state of the field right now um, moving towards those types of therapeutic targets that could then eventually be moved towards the clinic? Well, there's, of course, a few that are already um, moving towards the clinic now, like the antisense oligonucleotides uh, approaches for SOD1 are in trial. The, C, the similar for the C9R72 AS. So that's um, gone to trial as well. I believe it's enrolling now. There are, um, there are other good molecules that I'm, I'm not totally versed in, but some of the good therapeutic ideas that are out there are to look at how RNA granule biology might be impacted in the disease. Um, there's, um, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name, sorry. Um, the mesitinib, uh, for example, that's already quite advanced. These are things that are gonna be coming towards patients very, very quickly. And I, I think Angela can correct me if I'm wrong. These are things that are advanced and they're moving uh, forward. The RNA granule biology, for example, that, that is, uh, in much earlier stages, but this is a hot area focus of trying to figure out how to disperse inclusions within the motor neurons that are affected in the disease, and whether or not they are the inclusions that are of, composed of RNA, which is this messaging material in the cells that helps us to produce proteins, um, or else the dispersion of protein-based aggregates, either by using small molecules or um, biologics that have been engineered to disperse these entities. These things are uh, in early preclinical uh, in the labs. Uh, both using um, cell-based models, so using cells that are derived from patients, as well as um, uh, animal models, whether they be advanced animal models like rodents, <laughs> mice, and rats, or um, smaller organisms like uh, worms and flies. These things are being actively pursued in the field. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like we're surrounding something. Like when things are starting to be pieced together. I think. Uh, from uh, a pathogenesis standpoint in terms of, you know, I, I like to always think back to when we only knew about SOD1 and how much stuff was there to learn that we couldn't see and didn't know about. And then, you know, now looking at, you know, just going to a, an ALS conference and looking at the titles, you know, 10 years ago, we would not have even been able to fathom most of the things that that, that are now being done. And, and so that feels like we're, starting to surround 
something that we can uh, that we can find some really strong therapeutic targets to have a significant impact on the disease. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, There's a lot of optimism yeah. in the field right now, and because we are circling around particular pathomechanisms, and you know this idea of you know, TDP43 in RNA biology. I mean, this wasn't even in the conversation, you know, when I was in, doing my training. And so it's really exciting to see how the genetics have led us in a particular direction. And is um, really now 12 years out is we're starting to really think about it's leading us to think about how do we take this knowledge that we have while we still don't completely understand everything. There are uh, big teams and companies that are working towards trying to harness that understanding of the basic biology. And, and so it's a real rational drug design approach. It's like, let's get rid of these bad inclusions that are in the neurons that are lost in the disease. And maybe we're going to make the neurons better, for example. Okay, great. So Dr. Genj, uh, with the last four minutes, then I got one, one doozy question for you um, at right before six o'clock uh, for both of you. Um, and so from your standpoint, thinking towards the clinical end, and, and Dr. Vandeville covered a lot of the great things that are in the clinical spectrum right now, you know, What's your sense of, of what's right now in phase two, three? There were specific questions about neuron, um, uh, but also what the ASOs have been spoken about. You know, thinking about where we're at, what would what would your message be in terms of uh, uh, clinical trials moving forward at the moment? So I think we are at the, at the um, beginning of an incredibly exciting period with real, true, uh, valid treatments that are going to make a significant difference. I will not promise a home run, but I believe there are many drugs that will get us to first base, where the earlier we can identify conclusively that a patient has ALS and the earlier we can start some of these therapeutics, the slower their disease will progress and the more um, fulfilling and active life they will have. So I think there is absolute optimism here and I believe every patient should be looking for um, a site close to where they live so that they don't have to fly across a continent because they think they might have found the one that's going to be good for them. Trust these clinics closest to you that have the trials you want to go into. Go see them. See if you're eligible. See what makes sense. Be prepared to, to gain from being involved in a clinical trial. And those of you, those patients whose disease are a little bit farther along, as, as Christine mentioned, there are projects for uh, patients at every stage of their disease that are infinitely valuable. Take the opportunity. And um, so, actually, I'll, I'll take a quick moment on, on, on a question from Carolyn that, um, uh, just for Dr. Genge to follow up with that, uh, she had asked actually about taking part in a clinical trial and, and having that um, prevent her from being able to uh, actually take a medicine, if it were, approved by Health Canada. And, um, you know, I, I think it would be great to be able to let her know that that shouldn't prevent her from taking anything um, that uh, would actually be approved and prescribed by her physician. Um, but from your medical expertise, perhaps just the their their only type of trial that will prevent you from getting into a clinical trial uh, into their trial right now uh, is the stem cell trial. And the stem cell trials are the one thing that separate you and and do limit you uh, in what you can do in what else you can participate in and what other drugs you can be on. At this moment, there are only two um, clinical trials that are properly run clinical trials involving stem cells. There's a lot of stem cell stuff on the internet that is not accurate, but there are two trials, uh, the most famous being Brainstorm, 
If you want to go in brainstorm, you cannot be on a Darabone or anything else. And if you go in brainstorm and receive stem cells, you cannot go into other trials. It's very much one thing only. Other than that, clinical trials are now allowing people in if they're on a Darabone. Clinical trials have always allowed people in on Riluzole. And as drugs are approved, they will be added and people will be able to stay on the new drugs that they get and still go into new trials. That's the way trials work. Great. And so we are almost at six o'clock. It's so easy to talk um, about all of this stuff. And we had a number of things we didn't get to. So please, if I didn't, if we didn't get to your question, please feel free to reach out and we can try to, um, I, I can try to respond to some of these offline. But I want to end with one question that I think can encompass a large part of the questions that we, we've got, um, which is from each of your standpoints, and I'd be happy to give my opinion as well. Do you think if there was anything out there in the world that really worked, as someone might say it works, to slow down progression of ALS, that we would know about it or find out about it through the various international collaborations that are going on and the, the hard work of people across the world? My, my sense is if anything was out there that actually did do this, we would know about it and we would tell everyone if we truly uh, had the scientific evidence behind it. But what are your thoughts, Dr. Vin? Oh, I absolutely agree. I mean, the, the Canadian ALS community is very plugged in on the international scene. I mean, Angela, Dr. Gange is actually one of the top recruiters for several of the, Amer the big American trials and other international trials. I mean, our, our Canadian community is very plugged in. We have many of us have collaborators that span the globe. If there was something out there that was working in a clinic for a subset of patients, um, Canada would know about it, and it would be quickly disseminated um, through the various clinics um, uh, and, and examined carefully. And if there was something that was truly working, I don't think there's any clinicians in this country that would deny access to some, a real therapy to any of their patients. Well, and I think you can see that with the way that we've approached a Daravon. Um and the way we're approaching Brainstorm. These are, we will never hold a patient back from getting a drug we think works. We will in fact become partners to patients to get access to drugs that we believe have a benefit. Our motivation is for patients with ALS to live better and to live longer and to be with us. That's our motivation. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, both of you. That is a quick hour, uh, at least from my side. I hope we were able to uh, answer as many of the questions as people, uh, or at least many of the questions that people had. Uh, again, if you uh, have follow-up questions, you can feel free to reach out to me and I can um, endeavor to find you the, the answers or at least uh, some help on those questions. But thank you both of you uh, for joining us today on the Ask the Experts. Hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. You're welcome, Dave. Thanks for asking me. Have a great evening. Thank you, you too. Yes, thank you, Dave. It was a wonderful opportunity. Much appreciated. Thanks, both of you.